Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Webinar Express. Uh, where we're going, we don't need cookies, organized by South East. If you are a university student attending today's webinar, you may want to sign up for the CIM Marketing Club newsletter. It'll keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is take a photograph of the QR code you see on the screen at the moment, and it will take you straight to the sign-up page on the CIM website. So, I'd now like to hand over to Kevin Joyner, Director of Data Solutions at Crowd, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks very much, Phil. At the end of the first Back to the Future film, uh, Marty turns to the doc, he's in the DeLorean, and he says, Doc, you're going to need to uh, back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88 miles per hour. If you remember, the, the, the time machine has to be traveling at that speed in order for it to, to leap through time. And the doc says, Marty, where we're going, we don't need roads. I hope I got that right. You know, it's an incredibly nerdy thing to have titled my presentation. It came to me in a moment. I regret it slightly. But actually, this presentation is about the future. It's about leaving behind a familiar solution that has taken us very far, but which is now inadequate. It's been a while in the making. I think this started with Edward Snowden. That was in 2013 when he, uh, he leaked details of what the NSA was doing to look at uh, transatlantic, transatlantic communication and American communication. And then in 2018, we had the Cambridge Analytica scandal and uh, the, uh, the, um, the coming into force of the EU GDPR. There's been, um, there's been a very public battle between Apple and the FBI over unlocking iPhones so that this is about privacy and so on. And, and what's happened here is that this has been a journey, a kind of mounting momentum caused by the combination of quite technical ideas and ideas about privacy and encryption coming into the mainstream. Rory Kettlin Jones explaining data protection on the BBC Breakfast programme, for example. And in combination with that, we've seen increasingly meaningful regulation. And this has resulted in a couple of big things happening with the biggest technology players in advertising. We've seen the likes of Apple and Mozilla really double down or take this new position uh, of their brand in relation to privacy. So Apple stands for privacy. And, and really, I think what we've seen there is Google forced to act a little quicker than it might have done to, to, uh, to, to fall in line with this mainstream momentum. And so we've seen wide industry changes amongst the biggest players because of this battle over brand positioning kind of in conjunction with that, in parallel with that, we've seen developments in the technology uh, of these biggest players in the market. And kind of that's what the rest of my presentation is going to talk about. And then we have also seen advertisers and publishers online fall in line with the data protection regulation. Increasingly, we're seeing compliance. And so all of these things are about advertisers or about technology companies. Uh, and in the end, it hasn't really mattered whether users care about privacy or even if they do, whether or not it affects their behavior. The, the, the most influential organizations in, in our market, the, the, the biggest influences on what we do in digital advertising, are kind of seen this whole thing snowball, caused this whole, whole thing to snowball. So in a nutshell, what, why is this a headache? What's, what's the concern uh, about uh, the changes that we're seeing in the digital advertising industry. Well, third party identifiers are on the way out. And there are alternatives and, you know, some suggestions about things that we can do perhaps to replace personal identifiers. But overall, the writing is on the wall for the third party cookie and for third party advertising or device IDs that we see on mobile devices. But, you know, this isn't just actually cookies is a nice shorthand, but this isn't just about cookies. It's about third party identifiers, the kind of identifier that some third party uses to, to track you across sites and apps. So that, that we're, we're saying goodbye to that. The other thing that's happening is that the advertising technology that we use online is being meddled with by Mozilla, you know, in their Firefox browser and, and by Apple in Safari uh, and also in iOS. We have to be concerned about whether or not we can trust the operation of advertising technology. 
against those types of tech businesses whose brand position is to protect their users from advertising technology. And then finally, what we're seeing is that users, given the opportunity increasingly, are withholding their own data deliberately. They're withholding consent for tracking. And so we, you know, this is another reason why we have less uh, data with which to um, make our advertising work harder or actually function at all. And, and the impact on the digital advertising industry has to do with targeting. So we're less, we're, the, the audiences that we've traditionally used are less available. And the identifiers, the, those cookie IDs, for example, that, that fill those audience, audiences are, are grow stale. They refer to, to broken uh, identities, right? The, the, basically, the ID doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, and then in bidding, you know, we rely a lot on, on data that tracks that we've seen some success online, but that tracking is less reliable. And so the algorithms that optimize our advertising towards those successes are less effective. And then finally, when it comes to judging the effectiveness of the advertising that we invest in, again, we have uh, measures of success that are less reliable or that are incomplete. And in some cases, like, for example, being able to track that somebody has seen an ad, that's an ad impression, it relies on cross-site tracking, or it has done until now, like that, that data may be completely unavailable altogether, you know, for some campaigns uh, and for the delivery of some ads. So that impacts on our ability to measure success and to, to improve and to plan. But it's going to be OK. There's three areas that I want to talk to you about today that are about responding to everything I've just said and adapting uh, what we do and compensating for these changes. You'll have noticed already that this is a presentation about digital marketing and that there are some technical concepts in it. And I will try very hard to make them really accessible. But if there's anything in here that you don't get because of language or because it's a new idea, please make a note. And I promise I will make it clearer in the Q&A. So privacy readiness. This is about protecting data quality. Now, it's not a one-off fix. It's not like something you, that we can do now just to instantly be ready for the future. I'm not going to explain all the items on this roadmap, but you see it's, it's like a journey of increasing maturity in your approach to protecting the quality of your data. And, and first of all, I want to talk about, like I'm going to show you a couple of ideas of some of the tools and the techniques that do appear on this, uh, on this kind of illustrative roadmap. Uh, and I want to start with um, the idea of compliance with data protection regulation and how that prevents us from having as much data from, from users as we used to. Advertisers and publishers are going to need to comply properly with data protection law. And you still see lots of examples where the consent questions on websites aren't, uh, aren't really legitimate. They don't actually offer any choice. But that's, uh, you know, you, you better check with your lawyer, right? I'm just providing information, but that's not legal. So um, we've seen so far 229 fines under the GDPR uh, for illegal data processing. And you might think, oh, well, you know, in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, they're going after the likes of British Airways and Experian, Ticketmaster, like massive businesses, and, and I'm not affected. But we are seeing in, in other countries in Europe that, for example, in Spain, uh, uh, a company that sells motorbikes was fined for insufficient legal basis for data processing. That, in other words, that means not having consent for, for, for tracking people. And in Italy, a website that sells wild mushrooms. So it, 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 I think this is going to catch up to us in the UK. And we are seeing, um, I work for a, a digital marketing agency, Crowd, among our, our uh, client base, we are definitely seeing increasing concern and questions about compliance with the law. So here's one thing that we can do about it. This is um, related to um, Google's advertising and, and tracking uh, products. Uh, Google have a, a feature called consent mode. I think this is a good example of how we can think differently uh, and bring new data science techniques to play that allow us to um, get past uh, some of the challenges that I've talked about. So you've got some users that come into your website, but only 70% of them consent to being tracked. And traditionally, that means that there's this chunk of 
uh, of users that you don't track, you might know roughly how many didn't consent, but you have no idea how many uh, didn't convert or what pages they looked at or anything like that. So it's very difficult. You kind of have to ignore the section of your audience, of your customer, of prospective customer base who don't consent to being tracked. Well, consent mode uh, allows the tracking technology to continue to function, but to do so without collecting personal data. Technically, it uses random user IDs. So it isn't tracking anybody. It's like it's counting the, the, the behaviors on the website, including the conversions. It aggregates them and then discards those individu individual hits. But Google's then able to use modeling to attribute the lost conversions, you basically you're you're filling back in the conversions that you lost, and uh, so far the results from this technology it's it's restoring 70% of the uh, of the conver conversions that couldn't be tracked because of um, withheld consent. So no cookies being set for that 30% of the site's uh, traffic, but uh, we still have a good measure of how that traffic performed. Here's another idea. So first party data for conversion tracking. You may have heard about the Facebook conversions API. Uh, and there is another product from Google for Google Ads called Enhanced Conversions that, that uh, adopts a similar technique. I, I'll try to explain what I'm talking about here. So on the left hand side, we, we've got an eye and a cookie, right? So, th so that is a user seeing an ad and being cookied. And the data about that is tracked to the ad platform, to Facebook or Google. But as they, you know, as time passes, as they progress around the internet, their browser, let's say it's Safari, breaks that cookie, expires it. Uh, and, and so there is no longer a valid reference to the person who saw the ad. So when they convert on the right hand side, they, that the measurement about their conversion relates to a broken cookie. And so that conversion can't be linked to the advertising campaign that helped to cause it. So the solution for this is that the conversion is also like the, let's say it's a sale on an e-commerce website. Data about that sale, the fact that it happens is also of course on your e-commerce platform or in your CRM platform. So it's on some server side application. And the, the technical solution here is to have the name and the email address and the phone number and the postal address and maybe some other stuff that you know about the user, about your customer, that's personally identifiable and have it delivered to Facebook and Google with a record of, the, of a conversion. Those ad platforms hold that same personal information about their users and so that personal information is used as the basis for identifying where the conversion came from. Uh, so it works within the walled gardens, right? It works within Facebook, it works within, within Google, but um, advertisers are seeing significant uplifts to the conversions that they're able to observe by putting some of these technologies in place. Okay, um, another one. Uh, this is how, this is a diagram that shows how uh, tracking on websites works today. So uh, we normally use a tag management system uh, and that allows us to kind of, helps us to put into the website all the different tracking technologies that we need to, uh, to track the way the, the, the website is used, track the performance of the, the advertising and so on. And each of those trackers or tags is sending its data off to the servers of the, of the tracking vendor, whether it's Google or some other uh, measurement or, or audience technology. And, and an alternative to this is emerging and Facebook in particular are saying this is the future of tracking digital advertising. And that's server-side tracking. So the model here is that on the website, on the left-hand side, you, you still have a, a tag manager, but it might only have one tag in it. And that one tag sends its data to a uh, kind of like an equi equivalent tag manager, we call it a container, right, on your server, on your server, not on Google's or anybody else's, it's on your server. And inside that container on your server, are the tracking tags that send the data off to your various uh, technology partners. It means that on the website, returning to the left-hand side of the diagram, we've got one tag, it's a first-party tag, the technology for it comes from your web domain, so it's really robust and it's very difficult to imagine, uh, like Apple ITP, for example, you know, Apple's uh, tracking prevention technology. It's very hard to imagine 
Apple seeing that as third party advertising technology. There's nothing about it that's that's third party. So first party data, that's the other, that's the other um, area where we can respond. The reason that people are talking about first party data so much is that it addresses so many of the issues um, that, that we face. So audiences are breaking down. Well, you can define them with first party data. I should say, by the way, first party data is the data that you hold and control that describes your customers. And it, it, will, it will often, it will almost always be personally identifiable. So names, email addresses, phone numbers, what people bought, how long you've known them, all the stuff that's in your CRM, right? So you can use that to, to compensate for the, um, the failure in third party audiences. You can reinforce conversion tracking as we've already seen. In digital attribution, that's increasingly broken, but we can shift our efforts towards understanding the value of customers better instead of fussing over how to attribute their, them you know, first having been acquired. I'll give you some examples of that later. And then automation. So there are um, technologies that are available to everyone now, built into, in, into advertising platforms that level the playing field. You don't have to be, you can be good at Google Ads, right? But so is everybody else because it's automated anyway. Well, first party data is your new unique asset that you can leverage that allows you to be market beating. Uh, again, here's, a, here's another one of these, it's, it's not a one-off fix roadmap type things, but it starts with segmenting your customer base and, and uploading audience lists. Uh, there's, there's automation I've mentioned, CRM is important. This, is, this re relates to making sure that your CRM program integrates properly uh, with your, your biddable, you know, your digital advertising activity. Um, uh, and then on the right hand side, there are different techniques for um, like new and better measures of value that you can achieve through um, prediction, machine learning prediction. So most of this starts by drawing two sets of data together. On the left hand side here, we, we have all the data that describes the journey of your pros prospective customers through to the point when you acquired them, through to the point when they first transacted on your website. And then on the right hand side, the symbol there represents all the data that you know about the value of your customers. What did they do? How often did they repeat purchase? What, what, what do we know about their profile? But you know, especially their value, right? So we bring those two data sets together. One thing that we can do is use machine learning to cluster that complete data set. And it will reveal a lot about the pro different profiles among your highest value customers. So on the left-hand side here, imagine this is a B2B uh, advertiser. We've got this really interesting high value, high lifetime value cluster that tend to be, uh, they tend to have high value deals. Their transactions are, are, are highly valuable. They close those deals in a reasonable amount of time and they have a preference towards a, a certain category of product. On, on cluster B, we've got, um, we've got customers who tend to repeat, right? So they might not be high value deals, but they repeat a lot uh, and they always close quickly and they prefer a certain, uh, a different uh, product category. Well. If your business needs volume, then you target, you switch your budget to, to uh, cluster B. If you need revenue and, and you, you can um, uh, make a longer play, then, then, you, then you get your marketing strategy behind cluster A. You know how to speak to these people because you know what products they prefer. And you, you might, if your data set includes it, you might know how to reach them. Like, how old are they? Where are they geographically? You can even run out the record of customers that, that are literally in, in these clusters, their emails, their names, and, and so on, and use them as the basis of first party data audiences, as I mentioned before. Okay, and this one, I mean, <laughs> this is kind of like a mind blowing thing for me when I first began to understand what we can do with first party data. So at the top there, you have that merging of the data sets, and then down and on the right hand side, you have the clustering and the audiences that I talked about. But down the middle, we can develop a model that's able to predict the lifetime value on the basis of the acquisition data, because we brought those two data sets together. Well, we can host that predictive model so that it becomes a live in-flight campaign asset. Then when new customers are acquired, we send the data that describes their acquisition to the model, retrieve a prediction about their long-term value, and use it to you, you know, leverage it with the automated bidding algorithms in the ad platforms that we use, and suddenly we've got a new marketing machine here that doesn't just bid to acquiring new customers, it bids to acquiring the highest value new customers. 
Okay, so how do, how do you begin all this? Well, um, these are the simple first steps. Find out about your data. So what systems is your data on? Who is in charge of those systems? What data are we talking about? What's the schema? And then find out what quality is it? Uh, you know, what, what, um, what state is it in? Are there problems with it? Th these are, the, um, these are the, uh, uh, the questions that you need to answer early on so that you can put yourself in a position to begin down that roadmap that I showed at the beginning of this section. So I'm on to my last area now, which is effectiveness. So what we mean by effectiveness is that we, we have focused in digital marketing uh, a lot on digital attribution. This has always been the special power of digital marketing is that we can track individuals and we can track ads and we can match ads directly to the individuals and what they did. Well, that is breaking down as, as I've been explaining. And so digital attribution is no longer the sort of sole method that we ought to focus all our efforts on. There are lots of reasons for wanting performance data. Uh, we might want it for the bidding uh, and the automation that I mentioned earlier, managing our budget across uh, budgets across channels, uh, maybe regular reporting on performance, reporting to different stakeholders, uh, making creative and strategy decisions. Uh, there might be some ad hoc reporting that we need to do, you know, a spec that we haven't necessarily foreseen, um, and so on. And like I've said, digital attribution used to be the core and perhaps the only um, method for providing the data uh, for all those use cases. And so on this on the screen here, you can see two uh, facts. It is not true anymore that any single method can meet all performance data needs. And also, it's not like we've got a different perfect method that we can suddenly start pursuing. Every measurement method is flawed. So by measuring every objective in your marketing strategy in at least two different ways, then we can, uh, we can arrive at a balanced view of performance. It's at the, you know, the truth is going to be somewhere near the intersection of those two views of performance. So digital attribution is on the left-hand side there, and I've, I've mentioned it a bit already. It's still very important. It's our day-to-day -day technique for getting quick, um, uh, a quick measure, you know, um, near real-time data about the performance of the campaigns that we're running. So we definitely need it. And you can imagine, um, camp, you know, your channel teams or, um, you know, your, your campaign teams launching some new creative or making an adjustment to a targeting a strategy or something like that and just wanting a quick read early on as to how it's um, you know the difference it's making uh, if you know the flaws in digital attribution then you it, that empowers you to use it and you can still get a reading on the uh, the impact that your change has had controlled experiments so I mean we are all familiar with the idea of split testing and especially in digital it's something that we have always done this is a reference, though, to not, not, not split testing samples, you know, like defined by cookies on a website, but it will normally be regional control cells where we hold back some budget or weight the budget differently to see what the impact has been of uh, a, new, a new change to our campaigns or a new change to our activity. It is a different mindset for digital marketers because we've normally thought of split testing as a technique that we use to, like, Optimize to make make something better. Oh, let's let's introduce a a, a version two of that creative and see whether or not it, um, it it performs better than the previous one. And we can still do that. But but what I'm talking about here is a program of, of testing that's designed to establish benchmarks that you can use to uh, calibrate digital attribution. These are benchmarks that answer like strategic measurement questions. So if you know you need to refresh your view on what Facebook impressions do for you, or like the, the total effect of Facebook activity, which is hard to measure, it's hard to measure in digital attribution, well then you set up a split test that establishes that every three months. And, and there will be, and you use it to calibrate the digital attribution metrics, and there will be other questions that you need to answer in the same way. Causal effect analysis. We use a, a, a data science technique called causal impact. Uh, and this approach is about um, using data science to 
to forecast the expected value of a KPI based on um, based on a long history and, and sort of like uh, benchmarking it against other time series, um, relevant time series data. So it's a bit like you're saying, we did something at a certain point in time. And at that point of time, if nothing had changed, then how would the KPI have continued on into the future? And then you compare that to the, um, the actual performance of the KPI and so prove the incremental uplift of whatever it was that you did uh, at that moment in time. And then we have marketing mixed modeling. That's like the, the, the Rolls Royce of uh, cookie-less attribution. And this will tell us um, the contribution that you know, many elements of, our, of the marketing mix, including what competitors were doing or seasonality, or you, know, you, could, you could put a, a, a metric that's a proxy for the impact of COVID into your marketing mix you know, over time. Uh, and this would tell you, you know, what is causing performance. Uh, it's a brilliant tool. It's a brilliant approach. It takes a lot of work and a lot of data. So that's why it needs to be in the um, in the palette for us to choose from in the toolkit. Um, but uh, like all the others, it's not the only method. Oh, and just to point out, those don't need cookies. Uh, where we're going, we don't need cookies. Uh, here's an example of causal impact. Um, so the output looks a bit like this. You can see the green line and, and the um, margin of error around it. That's where we would have expected the uh, the KPI to go, but we we observed um, an uplift. And this this example for one client revealed that they had not understood seventy thousand pounds worth of value from the activity that they ran. There we go. So um, privacy readiness. This is how to adapt um, to to protect the quality of your data given what's happening in the industry. First party data, um, uh, this is a, about how to compensate and, and uh, to, um, to, to realize a different competitive asset. And then effectiveness is about adaptation to what's happening in the industry and making sure that you have more than one method in your, in your measurement uh, toolkit. Next steps on the, on the right hand side, think about whether or not your business is complying with data protection regulation and plan for when it's going to, uh, if it doesn't already. Think about how consent or the absence of it is going to affect your marketing and how therefore you can um, uh, you know, modify the way that you collect data. I, would, I also really believe that server-side tracking is, is very important to the future of digital advertising. So th think about your roadmap towards it and there are small steps that you can take. Uh, and then data discovery, I talked about um, systems, stakeholders, schema, and quality. So do that exercise, get yourself ready to use first party data. And then finally, take a new view on, uh, on your approach to effectiveness and make sure it is a considered program with, I, with a diverse uh, set of methodologies. Give me a shout if you'd like to. I'm Kevin Joyner, Director of Data Solutions at Crowd. So uh, hopefully I'll hear from you. That's uh, great. Thanks very much, Kevin, for a really good in-depth sort of technical presentation. Okay, um, Kevin, we're now going to have uh, a short Q&A session. Um, first question is, are you aware of any plans for the UK to implement the proposed EU e-privacy regulations? It all went quiet a while ago, and I can't find any information on it anywhere. Uh, I better not speculate. I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know what the plan is for that. Uh, not a very good answer to my first question, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there's, no, there's no point in me uh, guessing, right? Sorry. Okay. Well, you'll, you'll have to do better with this one then. Um, is server-side right. tracking difficult to implement, bearing in mind dev backlogs most of us are wrestling with? Um, I put it on my website, don't bother visiting it, kevinjoiner.com, uh, and I did it in, I think, half an hour, maybe something like that, maybe less. I mean, I did understand the technical directions. Um, it, you know, and I'm talking about using um, Google Tag Manager's server-side container. Um, but of course, like if it's your personal website, you, you don't have so much to worry about, like taking the site down by accident. Um, but it isn't a big deal. Um, you, you know, it helps if you're already using um, Google Cloud Platform, uh, but it will work with um, other cloud platforms as well. Um, if you're not already using Google Cloud Platform, you can talk to a reseller like Crowd. Um, and uh, you don't have to like move all your tags, right? That would be a big and serious undertaking, but setting up the container and doing something like using it to introduce 
Google Analytics 4 to your website if, if you don't already have it there, or, or moving a default implementation of, of Google Analytics to, to your server-side container. That, that's very simple to do and, and is, a, is a good first step. Um, there, are, um, there are other uh, ways to do it and other kind of products in, in this area. So um, you'll have heard of CDPs, customer data platforms. They are effectively, so you know, they can effectively offer server-side tracking. So if you're already using one of those, then you, you may ha almost already have everything you need in place. Um, and if you're using other tag managers, I mean, Telium has evolved into a CDP uh, anyway, but Telium has had, you know, for some time has had server-side tracking uh, features. Um, but in short, if you're if you're using Google Tag Manager, um, it's not uh, it's not a massive undertaking. Um, so there you go. Okay, great. Um, so let's have a look. So a question around Google Analytics, actually, in the last year or so. Um, we've seen major changes due to GDPR, et cetera. So for example, headline data such as time on site, events rate, and related deeper data have all seen major shifts. Is there any way to aggregate these out other than trying to encourage cookie acceptance, which as you say, is not the future? Um, no, you, I mean, you, the, the, the changes in the metrics, like especially the users metric is a key example. Some of the people like in my uh, in my analytics team don't really pay attention to that metric anymore in the current version of Google Analytics because it has become unreliable. Uh, and you know it's like the nature of the problem that there's not very much we can do about that. Um, if if there is an opportunity for you to introduce a first party user identifier into Google Analytics, then that will help a lot. And I also I strongly recommend beginning to work with Google Analytics 4 because it, it is more robust in some of these like user identifier um, with, with some of these like identifying users challenges. And the metrics are different as well, like the way that the time on site and bounce rate and all that, well, not bounce rate, but, but engagement with the site, the way that all of that is, um, it is tracked is different and better. Uh, and also more at home with app tracking. You know, GA4 is actually more uh, uh, an app tracking, originally an app tracking platform with web made to fit in, which is maybe a uh, like very sensible given the way that people use the internet now. So um, yeah, those are my my comments on it. But without looking at the data and understanding exactly what's happened in it, and also the website that you're tracking from, I probably can't go much deeper on it. Okay, you just mentioned GA4 and um, somebody's asked is that an essential cookie? Uh, no, I mean I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, you, you know you, you'll have to make your own mind up about that um, but yeah I don't know. My, my, I have to, we do have to be cautious about interpreting the law for our clients and here I am like speaking to quite a, a few people and, and um, you know, so you have to make your your mind up about that. But um, if if tracking if cookies are essential to your website, it means that the the website can't function without them, and that the experience, whatever it is the user is trying to do, they won't be able to do it if if that that technology is not functioning. So analytics, you know, measurement technologies are, in my view, uh, not essential. Okay. Um, do all sites need accept, manage, or decline options on their cookie policies to avoid risk of a GDPR fine, or can you still get away with just accept for now? Yeah. So I kind of referred to this in in the presentation. Um, you know, you again, you have to talk to your legal team. You have to make your own mind up about it. But if you read the uh, information commissioner uh, commissioner's office. Uh, website, um, they they will say that um, just telling people that they're being tracked and giving them a button to dismiss that banner is uh, is not compliant. Uh, and in fact, you know, again, read read the ICO's guidance on this. But um, you know, my view is that, uh, and I, I believe it's the law. Um, you know, if you don't 
if you if you if you load tracking technology of any kind apart from essential you know cookies before the user has has expressed their choice about consent then that's illegal or, or you know that does not comply um which is why we need a solution like google consent mode which i um uh which i presented about so take a look at this question when i talked about looking at compliance and and putting your plan together yeah take a look at this carefully you don't and don't look at what other websites are doing if you want to know what the law is um try and work out you know you know what you want to do about the law um and i think as i've said like increasingly advertisers and publishers are going to need to comply the ico um complied with their own guidance um in the way that i've described and they lost a visibility of 90 percent of their traffic so you, you know, and that's you can look that up that's um that's documented written about online and uh you know, so what I the other thing I'd add is that the user experience of the consent question is really important. You know, you can comply with the law, but uh, make sure that you get a choice from the user. You know, you can make your own mind up about how abrupt you want to be, but let's say you do a full page overlay with a yes, no, and no cross, right? Then at least you get a choice. You know, at least you get a decision from the user. Almost the worst thing is to make it too easy for the user to ignore the consent uh question make yes a big green button and make no gray or you know whatever you can do that kind of stuff okay I think. um got, got another question that which relates to server-side tracking again um kevin so do you have any recommendations for an overview on setting up server-side tracking or a how-to guide uh it's well doc so again for the, the one i know most about is um a server-side gtm google tag manager container and the documentation on um, on Google's website is is good. Uh, it's like step by step. So um, I would take a look at that. Um, uh, yeah, it's the best thing. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, if we have a first party data collection focus via competitions, opt in for marketing, for example, tags in analytics, etc. Once we've got that customer data without a cookie. This goes into a CRM. How do how do I use that data to serve them communications other than Facebook ads and emails? Um, so, so I, I think maybe the reference to Facebook ads has to do with them being on your Facebook page or something like that. Um, oh well, well, any, anyway, the the approach here is to um, is to prepare lists of customer records. And um, for Google, I believe it's that they need to contain at least the, the email address, um, but it varies from different platforms. Uh, Google, um, uh, Google Ads, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn all have a feature uh, along these lines that that customer data is hashed. It's like a one way encryption and uh, it, it's up. Then you, you upload it through the um, uh, the ad platforms. API uh, and then th with a match to the ad platform's record of users, the audience is formed. So in the case of Google Ads, that feature is called customer match. Um, and Facebook has, has a very, very similar feature. It is a bit tricky and it depends what, um, I mean, it's a data engineering um, solution that we're talking about. Um, and it depends what CRM you're using. So, you know, you perhaps you can have your CRM platform regularly export um, customer lists and then some script uh, running on Google Cloud Platform that collects the list and hashes it and delivers it to the API. If you're using Salesforce Marketing Cloud, for example, they have a module called um, Advertising Studio that, that makes the whole thing quite simple. Um, and indeed, like if you've got Google Analytics 360, the enterprise um, version of Google Analytics, and you're using Salesforce Marketing Cloud, you, you don't even need to really worry about um, audience lists at all because the audiences in Marketing Cloud can be automatically synced with um, Google Analytics, which can then be imported to Google Ads and um, your, your display activity that you might run on Google. Remember, like these lists, like for, in order for them to work, they've got to have a minimum number of users in them. So it, 
it, it would normally be something like a thousand. Um, so yeah, don't don't think of it. You know, with email, you can send a person an email, and it can be personalised for that one individual. Well, this is about building advertising audiences, so it's a little bit broader um, than that. Okay, um, I think we've got time for just one more question, uh, Kevin, and this is around um, B two B marketing. So, what advice do you have for a B two B company that uses cookie based advertising, lead generation to build first party data? where existing first party data is limited and clients are buying high value items once or twice in their lifetime. Hmm. Um, well, uh, I think um, like when the, when the um, uh, like, um, what do you call it? The, the, the pace of new customer acquisition deals being signed is quite slow. It means you have quite low volume of data that describes the ultimate business objective, those deals, right? The volume of data is quite low there. So you can't, it is more difficult to do things like predicting the long-term value of, of um, you know, customers, uh, like the deal that they're gonna sign. But you can go up the funnel. So most B2B um, uh, advertisers have a sales process uh, and they're concerned with things like how fast does the lead go through that sales process, getting rid of the duds right at the beginning. Um, uh, you know, the, you, normally like you'll, you'll score the leads or you'll validate them as an opportunity and add some estimated value or something like that. So all of those are, uh, are good measures of value. Um, so you, uh, the simplest thing is just to begin to um, work with the lists of uh, leads, you know, as soon as you can put a good uh, value on them, the lists of leads that um, are looking like the highest value, that are moving through the sales funnel fastest and with least effort, and use them as the basis of your um, audiences. Um, I think that would be my, yeah, I think that's my my main recommendation for B2B. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Kevin, for that. And thanks for all the answers to all of the questions for today. Um, that is all the time that we have for today's webinar. So I'd just like to say thank you to Kevin for today's presentation and to the CIM Southeast for organizing the event. We do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express crisis leadership, how to lead effectively in the toughest of circumstances on Monday, the 14th of June at 1 p.m. hosted by CIM Southwest. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, thank you once again, Kevin, for a really good presentation, really good Q&A, and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.